Hey team, I'm Maddie. Welcome to Science Side Up. Um, and today we're going to talk about what it's like to be a geologist uh, with my friend Anne. Uh, so my name is Ann Miller and I am a paleontologist for Grand Canyon National Park. <laughs> Zink, what's this? Hey, Zink. What's that? Hi. Okay, I have to redo my intro because I called you a geologist. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, same thing. Um, I am also a geologist. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I just specifically do paleontology. Okay. Technically, I'm an ichnologist, which okay. means that I study trace fossils. It's just a branch of paleontology, except trace fossils have their own categorization, their own classification. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all based on the behavior of the animal when they're alive. And so okay. I really love trace fossils because they, um, they show you what the animal was doing when they were alive, whereas most body fossils just kind of show the animal as it died and turned into stone, right? right. And so you don't really get any information on how they lived how they interacted with the, each other or how they interacted with the sediment. And so trace fossils really help um, give that information on paleoecology. So. I do really love that you and I, of our graduating high school class of 21 kids, right? We've got at <laughs> least two scientists in the group. I know. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, um, and so, okay, so how did you go from, you know, Wright Christian Academy, 21, <laughs> 21 kids, um, to where you are, are now? And we haven't really talked much in the last True. decade. Because um, <laughs> yeah. I ran off to the East Coast. <laughs> um, and I ran off to the West Coast. <laughs> okay, okay. Gotcha. So where did you do your undergrad? So I did my undergrad at Oklahoma State University, um, okay. but I started at a community college because I had no idea what I wanted to do after Wright Christian Academy High School. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had no idea. I just knew that I loved to travel. I loved to learn about different places, different cultures. And so at community college, I kind of took a lot of different classes that had to do with geography. Um, I was actually very interested in meteorology because of, you know, tornadoes in Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so I took a few, <laughs> yes, totally. I mean, it's the only exciting thing. And so I took a few meteorology classes, climatology and stuff like that. And um, I really enjoyed it, but it was like, there was still something missing. And then um, I realized, I don't know how I realized it, but somehow it was like a light bulb and it was like oh geology that's totally what I love about places I realize I'm taking pictures of rocks and I'm just like looking at rocks all the time who knew that I had a passion for rocks and I remember uh, in elementary school I would always go to this tree during recess and and um, I would start digging up the roots <laughs> of the tree <laughs> And eventually I brought brushes to school and I like got my friends involved and we were all just kind of like brushing these limbs of a tree. <laughs> and I would pretend they were dinosaur bones that we were like discovering new things from the ground. And so these were like the memories that I remembered. And I was like, well, clearly I remember these for a reason. I loved that stuff. And so that's when it kind of came to light when when I realized geology is probably my thing. <laughs> and then eventually paleontology. <laughs> That's super cool. There's a variety of jobs. I've always loved fossils and paleontology. And so it just sounded like a really cool thing. Um, in undergrad, I took geology and minored in geography. Okay. And actually my interest was volcanoes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. After my undergrad, I did a little bit of adventuring, some some internships. Mm -hmm. I started out on a, a trail crew, um, you know, in the desert, plus in the forest. And so I, that's how I kind of got my outdoor, um, getting used to the outdoors is, is through my trail crew experience. And 
Um, and then I got an internship with uh, GeoCorps, which is okay. from the Geological Society of America. But yeah, so I started doing paleontology there and there I was studying the Navajo sandstone, the tropic shale. Um, these are all kind of uh, like dinosaur trackways and plesiosaur and mosasaur teeth, like just really cool stuff from the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that really sparked my interest in paleontology specifically. Mm -hmm. um, Cause all we had in Oklahoma were crinoids, which I still love, but crinoids, I think I have one here. They're like, um, oh yeah, it's really tiny actually, but this is just like a, a stem of a crinoid. Okay. And so it has like this little ossicle. Uh -huh. Um, but it's technically a sea lily, and so it has this flower at the top, um, but it's a predator. <laughs> uh, and so those fossils are in Oklahoma, um, yeah. but that was kind of all I really could experience there was mm -hmm. these marine invertebrates. And so coming out west was really exciting. I got to see these footprints made by dinosaurs, and then eventually in Grand Canyon, footprints made by reptiles, way older than dinosaurs, and it, everything just blew my mind. And so, long story. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's how I ended up in paleontology and geology. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. And when I was working for Glen Canyon, mm -hmm. uh, I had this opportunity to go on a fossil dig at uh, Grand Staircase Escalante. Okay. Um, and so that's in Utah. And I worked with uh, a couple paleontologists there. And we, um, they had this site with hadrosaurs and turtle shells and different things like that. And, um, and so we hiked about three miles away from that area to, uh, because this paleontologist knew about a site that, that had tyrannosaur bones. And so this was kind of my first couple months of really entering the world of paleontology. And so I was really excited. We go to this spot where he thinks there's tyrannosaur bones. And when I say tyrannosaur, I'm talking about the ancestor of T-Rex. Okay. So um, a little bit, um, a little bit older than T-Rex. Mm -hmm. And uh, we start digging and we're sort of picking apart these layers of rock ever so carefully. We're actually using dental tools. Um, and, you know, this other volunteer over here is finding some little micro bones. And so we know that there's stuff here and I'm kind of, I'm excited, but I'm sort of getting a little like, okay, maybe nothing's going to happen. Um, and then I lift this layer and it looks like potentially bone and and it looks like this kind of long bone in there and so I ask the paleontologist um, is this bone material and he freaks out um, <laughs> mainly because he thought it was part of the skull which oh, okay. it wasn't <laughs> but he freaked out because he thought it was part of the skull um, and then he realized oh no 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 okay it's a metatarsal bone which means it's actually um, a toe from the Tyrannosaur. Okay. And so um, he's still excited. Of course, he's kind of like calmed down. He's like, okay, it's not a skull, <laughs> but it's a toe. That's awesome. And so we keep um, digging, digging this up and we find three toes and they're like this long. It was so cool. That's so, so I cool. found basically a foot from a Tyrannosaur or an ancestor of a T-Rex. I found out several years later that uh, they were able to dig up about 75% of that skeleton from that Tyrannosaur. From GeoCore, um, did that bring you into like your master's program or? Oh yeah, so I, yeah, so GeoCore, and then I got another GeoCore position at Grand Canyon. Um, Grand Canyon didn't, doesn't really have a permanent paleontologist. Uh, and so I just started as a paleontology intern. Um, eventually they paid for my grad school. That's and awesome. so um, I was able to go to grad school, be a research assistant, doing paleontology at the park 
but also doing my thesis work mm -hmm. um, at the park. And so my research benefited Grand Canyon National Park. Um, and so that's how I got funded, which was an amazing opportunity. And this was just, this is my dream is to like, is to do geology and paleontology in Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And so it all like came together and now they want to hire me as their legitimate paleontologist. So, so I'm, cool. I'm kind of in a transition period right now. Okay, so what does it mean to be a paleontologist for the national parks? Because all I see about you are your like um, Facebook posts of like living in a tent in the Grand Canyon and kayaking <laughs> to work. That makes me really jealous of your style. Well, so I'm kind of a 50% field work, 50% office work. Um, and so when I'm in the office, I'm sort of maintaining the inventory of fossils that we have on our geo database. And then when I'm in the field, of course, I am <laughs> camping. Um, basically getting in the canyon is difficult. So you always have to, you know, kind of have this safety um, view. What is the uh, like scariest thing that's happened while you've camped in the Grand Canyon. Just so you know, in my mind, I have a head cannon that you have fought a bobcat. That's, you're not going to really be able to dissuade me of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've actually seen the eyes of a cougar Ooh. in the shadows, okay. and that was really scary. But that sounds really scary. I was with someone else, and it didn't do anything. It was just we had a feeling because the next morning we saw all these like cougar tracks <laughs> around the camp and and when we camp in the canyon like mm -hmm. unless we know for sure it's going to be rainy the whole time we don't bring a tent we just it's too heavy mm -hmm. so we just lay out a tarp put our sleeping pad out and sleep on the ground and so sometimes you know <laughs> you feel a little exposed <laughs> That's honestly how most people die in the canyon is dehydration. So okay. I was actually on a, a search and re a rescue mission. Oof. I know, I guess this is another story, but um, just to be quick, uh, yeah, it was no. really cool because I got to volunteer with this search and rescue. And um, that means I got to get helicoptered into the canyon. And then we were on the ground searching for this guy. Um, and then the helicopter came and pick, picked us up. So it was just like really cool official. Um, I was a little bit nervous about finding a corpse because mm -hmm. usually if you're looking for someone, you're most likely looking for a body, mm -hmm. um, especially in the middle of summer when it's, mm -hmm. you know, over a hundred degrees at the bottom. So um, anyway, sad thing. We didn't end up finding the guy um, and someone found him a year later, his body. So Ooh. yeah, but uh, Partially, I'm glad I didn't find it, but at the same time, like if he could have been alive, we could have saved him. So I really mm -hmm. struggle with that one. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know. I, I really yeah. wanted to find him, but I was really nervous about yeah. That's finding a dead body. <laughs> Fair. Um, in meteorology, one of the things, this hasn't happened to me, which I'm really glad, glad about, um, but when you're doing tornado research, um, it is not uncommon to be the first group on the scene when a tornado has gone through a town. And so you often have this like, um, scientists, you know, meteorologists, weather people being put in the role of like first responders until actually trained first responders can be there. Um, so wow. I think that's really interesting of, um, like just because of where you work and the nature of the environment in which you work, uh, like having to have those survival skills and um, potentially being in a position where you have to provide like that first aid uh, when you're, that's not what your job is. Like you're not a first responder, you're, you're here, to, you're, you're there for the fossils, but like um, uh, when you do, when you're, when you're an outdoor scientist, sometimes you have to be able to have a few extra skills. 
Um, it's true. I, ha I have a uh, first wilderness responder ooh, certification. That's very so cool. I'm ready. You're ready. <laughs> yeah. You're ready. <laughs> Pretty much to get into the canyon, you can only go either by river or by hiking a trail. And probably the shortest trail down to the river is about eight miles. Um, and so you're looking at over 5,000 feet of elevation. Um, and so you usually have to pack up everything with you on your back that you're going to sleep in. So your tent, your sleeping bag, um, all your food and everything, unless you're just doing a day trip. But if you're only doing a day trip, you should probably only hike about a mile down. <laughs> yeah. Because um, if I'm if I'm doing like paleontology work, it takes a while, um, mainly because I get really distracted. Because if I find a beautiful fossil, um, I pretty much just stare at it, do really detailed notes. <laughs> um, so yeah, it. You, you definitely have to plan ahead for each trip into the canyon, okay. whether it's a day trip or camping. Um, so when you are in the canyon, about on average, how long are you staying down there? So it depends. Um, sometimes we do car camp. Uh, it depends really on the formation that I'm studying in Grand Canyon, uh, because each formation is kind of, it's stacked like a, a layered cake, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the basement rocks at the bottom near the river, and then you have all these sedimentary layers on top. And if you go to one of those layers towards the bottom, you're gonna have to camp down there because you can't, you don't have enough time to do a day trip. You have to hike in and out, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you do one of those top formations, like the Coconino Sandstone, beautiful reptile trackways before the dinosaurs even existed, um, but anyway, you could do a day trip down there because that formation is a little bit higher up. Um, you know, you're still going to work hard. But so um, so sometimes we will, we will car camp at the rim and then hike each day if we're just doing the Coconino Sandstone. Um, for my master's thesis, my formation was the Bright Angel Shale, which is sort of right in the middle of Grand Canyon. <laughs> so um, I, there was no way I could just do a day trip. I always had to camp or do something. Um, I tried one day trip and it was a really, really long, tiring day and we didn't get very much data, so. <laughs> I've been to the Grand Canyon before and it's so beautiful, but I've never been down to the bottom. So can I just imagine camping down there with like without the light pollution and um, I'm, I, I'm, oh, gosh, I'm sure yes. there's so much beauty to, to uh, and a little bit of danger, but beauty and danger <laughs> to getting, getting to work. <laughs> in um, a field spot like that. So it's really cool. Yeah, the, the challenge really makes it worth it because you went through all this work to get to that place. And, and so you have enough motivation to want to collect all the data you need to or just take it all in because it's, you know, you're tired and you're hungry and thirsty. And um, I don't know, it's, you have to really appreciate it after you go through all that challenging hiking and everything um it's different when you just look at it from the rim you're almost like my first time at grand canyon before i even working here this was back in the day in undergrad and uh i went to the rim of the canyon for the first time and i was almost frustrated i was like i can't comprehend this i can't take it all in it's too much like i wanted to to like pick apart each piece of the canyon and I couldn't. And so when I came in to work at the canyon, then I started hiking all these trails and like going exploring inside. And, and now when I look at the rim, I look down and I'm like, oh, I hiked that trail, I hiked that trail, you know, it all makes sense to me and I can comprehend it now. <laughs> so That's it really so cool. makes a difference when you go down there. And it's also just such a different world. It's like you, so there's certain places where it's an oasis. There's this waterfall just coming out of the rock. There's creeks, there's cottonwood trees. I mean, it's so different from the top. You're going from 7,000 feet elevation where it's relatively cool um, most of the time. And then you go to the bottom, you're at about 2,500 feet elevation. And so, it gets like 10 to 20 degrees hotter at the bottom. 
And so it's just a different environment. Spring and summer happen so much sooner at the bottom of the canyon. Like it's, it's so weird. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> okay, so what is um, your favorite thing that you have found or that you have experienced while fossil hunting in the Grand Canyon? <laughs> Ooh, okay. There's a lot of favorite things um, yeah. because each fossil is unique and tells a very unique story. So um, it kind of depends for me. Um, there was one in particular that I found during my research for my master's thesis, mm -hmm. and it was this, it was a trace fossil. Trace fossils are basically these um, traces that organisms leave as they're uh, walking along the surface or burrowing in the sediment and so trace fossils are basically burrows of from worms or um, trilobite trackways um, you can even get reptile trackways so um, so what I found were actually these very simple little uh, striations and they were they were basically these parallel striations um, that looked like some sort of creature came in and s swooped down and scratched. And the cool thing about these is that it was so big um, for that time period. We're talking about the Cambrian. Okay. And it was so big that it had to have been made by um, either a trilobite or this other arthropod called Anomalocaris, um, which is kind of like the dinosaurs of the Cambrian. It's a giant shrimp creature with these <laughs> huge uh, appendages that just kind of like grab things. Um, <laughs> and so my hypothesis and my thesis was that this creature potentially created this trace where they came down and they were probably coming down to pick up some sort of trilobite to eat or, you know, other creature, a worm. Um, and it created these huge striations that are all parallel in line with each other. I identified it to the ichno species level, so I was really excited. But it's called Monomorphicness Linnaeus Variation Giganticus. So <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a strange type of fossil you wouldn't expect uh, that would be really exciting. But yeah. um, if you know the story, it makes it really exciting. This trace fossil mm -hmm. um, basically indicates that this creature, Anomalocaris, may have existed during the deposition of the Bright Angel Shale, which is really exciting because we have no actual body fossils that say Anomalocaris existed. Um, body fossil would be something like this. A, is that a trilobite? Because I, I love it. It is a trilobite. <laughs> I love him so much. That's really cool. Um, okay, so yeah. do we have a body fossil of the giant shrimp creature whose name I don't remember and couldn't pronounce anyway. <laughs> like, does that exist? <laughs> yes, actually. Um, the reason why I chose that specimen is because it exists in the Burgess Shale mm -hmm. of the Canadian Rockies. So okay. there's this locality that's just sitting in the Canadian Rockies, and it represents um, the base of a reef in an ocean. And basically, all these animals that live there kind of fell down during this turbidity current, which is basically a bunch of mud flowing inside of the water, like underneath the water. Um, and it buried all these creatures, and that's why we get these, these really beautiful fossils with soft-bodied preservation, which is a very rare thing. Um, and we've found uh, the appendages of this anomalocaris. So not always do we find it articulated together in one specimen. And so there was actually a struggle for a while in history where uh, paleontologists thought that this uh, appendage was some sort of creature. And eventually they found another appendage and, a, and the rest of the body somewhere else. Um, there's gotcha. some in China, in the Qingyang fauna. Um, this is all Cambrian time. And so eventually they figured out that these appendages are, were attached to this huge 
uh, shrimp, like almost the size of me. Um, imagine swimming with that in the ocean. <laughs> So, so I was just my really gut cool. reaction is like, I bet it would taste really good with garlic butter. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would. It probably would, honestly. Like that would be the most meat you could get in a shrimp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the real meaning of jumbo shrimp. <laughs> right. Right there. Okay. Although it could that probably might attack the... you, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean like high risk, high reward. There you go. Weather <laughs> attracts some conspiracy theories. Yes, that so, is true. Chemtrails. Chem- oh my gosh, yep. Because you do like interface with the public, right? Yeah. You have a favorite conspiracy theorist. Yeah, um, I do run into that issue. Um, but I think the one I hear pretty often actually in science, um, and we're talking like a creationist publication um (laughs) they really love to use the coconino sandstone uh which is a formation in grand canyon that represents about 280 million years ago from the permian time and uh this this was an area of it was basically a giant erg which means um sand dunes far as far as the eye can see so just a sand sea and so that's what this environment was um and we know this because uh the way that the rock solidified you you can see actual sand dunes preserved um just like the namib desert Mm -hmm. it's the same type of sand dunes you could see the cross bedding from those sand dunes Mm -hmm. um you can also see the grain sorting and that means that the individual grains in the sandstone are pretty well rounded um, and kind of equal in size. And so that means they were wind blown, which is representative again of a desert, a sand desert. Um, there were also uh, obviously trackways from reptiles, um, also spiders, scorpions. So we get these, these footprints, um, but some are really large. Others are pretty small and actually really cute because you can see little claw marks from the reptiles. Um, And so we have all this information to tell us that this um, formation was deposited in a desert environment. Mm -hmm. And so what a lot of creationists like to do is they like to claim that this formation was deposited underwater. Um, And this is because it goes with the flood. Gotcha. (laughs) And, you know, the interesting thing to me is that it's really not that far-fetched to say that a huge flood carved the canyon, because honestly, it had to have been multiple flooding events to carve that canyon. But what really irks me is that creationists often claim that the formations in Grand Canyon were deposited by Noah's flood. And that is so wrong geologically (laughs) that it drives me crazy because we know about each formation. We know that there are marine fossils from one of the lowest formations. Mm -hmm. And And in between those formations is a desert. On top of that desert is another ocean. So there is no way that yeah. one flood deposited all these different layers because they each each layer represents a completely different time period. I mean, we're talking erosion happened. And so there's even time missing in between these layers. Mm-hmm. So it's it just really gets to me when they say that the flood deposited the formations in Grand Canyon. It's just not possible. If you, if you were an actual geologist, you'd know what the rock is telling you. You'd know what the fossils are telling you. We have all kinds of clues that give us the answers we need, and it's not a flood. <laughs> yeah, it's many different depositional environments. That's a good one. Does that one come up so, pretty often? Yeah. Even at our scientific conference, the Geological Society of America, they had a session 
dedicated to communicating science to creationists. Wow. <laughs> so this is a very common thing for geology because creationists don't believe in evolution. And that's, mm -hmm. that's obviously a big thing with geology, but it's not just evolution, it's geologic time. Mm -hmm. And that's where they can't really, well, they obviously can't prove anything, but they claim that, you know, the earth is what, 6,000 years old or something. And that's just not right. I mean, yeah. we have so many different dating methods not just carbon dating, but we have uranium dating, argon dating. I mean, basically you can take any element, as I'm sure you know, yeah. <laughs> as a scientist, <laughs> and figure out how it decays and how long it takes. Yeah. And so there are a lot of different ways. Um, one of the primary, primary ways we use is zircons, using detrital zircons. I love zircons. Oh, sorry, there you go. I love zircons yeah. so much. Um, I did. I have a video on uranium lead dating with zircons. Oh, cool! And about why um, zircons are so cool. Well, I I do have a few other fossils to show you. So yes. I just have this really beautiful ammonite oh. fossil that I wanted to show you. Oh, I love it. I love Obviously, it's so polished. Much. Yes. But here's the other side That's beautiful it's so pretty <laughs> it is and, and and from what period of time is that from um this would be from the cretaceous okay period um that's actually when they became extinct but okay. um yeah so this was around when the dinosaurs were roaming around especially things like plesiosaurs and mosasaurs Mm -hmm. um, they had special teeth for clam crushing, and so a lot of those sharks ate these things. Probably not this big, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, this is an ammonite. So cool. That's so. Had cool. to show that one. Yes. And then, um, mm -hmm. as far as a trace fossil, um, here's kind of an example of worm burrows. Oh, so a lot okay. of people don't really think this is very exciting, but basically these. Uh, little burrows here. You can kind of see them if yeah. I make the light a little bit better. Yeah. Lighting is really important, but you can see these little worm burrows. Mm -hmm. And so these were made by, um, my guess is priapulid worms from okay. the Cambrian period, which is about 500 uh, million years ago. Okay. And so, um, but it could also have been made by annelid worms. Um, Turns out there were a lot of worms uh, in the, the start of ancient life. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Um, let's see if this will show up. Depends on the lighting. It's a very little small piece of um, siltstone. Okay. And you can kind of see that there's a little trilobite trackway on there. Can you see it? I can see kind it. Of. That's so cool. It's like these little dots. She's just like <laughs> wiggling around. <laughs> yeah, just kind of walking along the surface. Oh, that's so, so cool. Um, so that's kind of the difference between trace fossils and body fossils. You have, you know, the anatomy of the, of the organism. Right. What did it look like? You know, what were its eyes like? Yeah. Um, but then here you have the trace fossil of what did it do? Know, I end up talking to a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. adults, that tell me, uh, oh, I was so interested in fossils and paleontology when I was a kid. And you can tell as adults that they really love it still. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, they thought that that wasn't a career that they could follow. Um, it didn't seem like, you know, a career that you can make much money. Uh, a lot of people just don't think it's very practical. And so I get all these people saying, oh man, I loved this as a kid or my kid loves this. And sure, I loved it as a kid too, but um, there's so much more to learn in paleontology as an adult. And so I just want to encourage those of you who used to love it or love paleontology or fossils as a kid, um, you can still have it as a hobby. 
there's tons of research out there that you can pretty much learn a lot of things on your own. Um, but also to encourage maybe some of the early career uh, young people that if you're trying to decide what you want to do and say you really loved fossils as a kid, go for it. Geology is so much fun. It was probably the best decision I've ever made in my life was to choose a career in geology. Yeah. I work outdoors so much and I never thought that was possible. Yeah. Um, and paleontology is just really cool because um, you get to discover new things. And so it's a really rewarding career. Go paleontology. And, yeah, paleontology <laughs> and geology and outdoor science. And what, what yeah. that, I, that I try to promote with this channel um, is not only like science education and science communication for people who haven't had the opportunity to spend their entire adult lives doing science, um, but maybe find it interesting, mm -hmm. but then also to try to showcase that like not all scientists like wear lab coats and deal with beakers. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. I had a lot of fun with this. I hope you did too. You. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry about the uh, internet issues. That's 100% that's no, okay. on my end. Oh. Once, <laughs> once I can make money with my internet. channel, I can pay for better internet. That's the plan. Um, so That would be awesome. <laughs> people should subscribe so I can hit a thousand subscribers, so I can make money off of ads, so I can pay for faster internet, so I can do more interviews. <laughs> that's awesome, though, because... Well, I subscribed, first of all, and oh, hey, I can post it on my Facebook. Yeah, that'd be um, great. Something like interviewing me is really good for just outreach for Grand yeah. Canyon. Um, it's really hard to get the word out that there's fossils here. And mm -hmm. so... And you just know. so you know, since you subscribed before I hit 300 subscribers, you are now entered in the contest to win... I'm just going to get the, the uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex version of this primordial, of this tar pit no. dinosaur model that I found oh in the gosh. store for $3. <laughs> so, I saw that video. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I got yeah. so mad at this dude. So he lives here now. He lives on the shelf. But the T-Rex one is unopened, and uh, is your oh. to win the contest. It's, um, oh my went gosh. for when I hit 300 subscribers. So <laughs> that sounds awesome. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. I hope I get it. <laughs> yeah, I hope you get it too. That'd be super cool. Um, yeah, that's that's how fossil hunting goes, right? You just find some like black slime and pull out a full dinosaur <laughs> carcass. Like, yeah. It's all articulated and yep. perfect. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today, team. I hope you all enjoyed this video and those uh, pictures of high school, Anne and Maddie. I'm going to leave you guys uh, with some artist renderings of dinosaurs and reptiles and fossils. Um, and I will see you all next time. All right. Bye, team.